Good evening, and welcome to the Waxahachie City Council Candidate Forum. Tonight's news event is sponsored by the Waxahachie Sun, the Waxahachie Chamber of Commerce, and is being broadcast live on KDEC 1390 AM and 99.1 FM, and can also be picked up via the station's stream and app applications. All candidates were invited to participate in this event. Each candidate, in accordance with FCT regulation section 73-1940, will be afforded the same amount of time. All audio content is the property of KDEC. Social media and video rights have been waived. Content and fact checking are the responsibilities of the candidates and forum format creator. The moderator for tonight's event is Philip Morgan. Thanks, sir. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to our live audience here who is in the uh, Fine Arts Center at Waxahachie ISD. We are very thankful to Waxahachie ISD for allowing us to host this event here. And I'm very honored, or thank you, Ms. King, for the opportunity to be here tonight to uh, have these candidates come up and uh, share some of their opinions uh, and beliefs regarding the uh, current status quo here in Waxahachie, Texas. These are candidates for the 2021 City Council Forum. Uh, these attendees tonight, running for place for this evening, is Paul Christensen. Joining Paul is also Mary Lou Shipley. And rounding up the other position in place four is Billy Wallace. For place five, we have Mr. Chuck Beatty, Darren Robinson, and Travis Smith. I will be your moderator this evening. Uh, my name is Phil Morgan. I'm the director of fine arts for Waxhatch ISD. And I'm uh, honored to have you guys and ladies in our space this evening. Of course, really important information. And to get to know our candidates tonight with some of their responses. We have some current formats that we're going to talk about tonight in our city council forum. And uh, one of the things that we want to start off with, too, obviously, is to uh, be able to introduce our candidates and let you know a little bit about them if you don't. Um, first of all, candidates, thank you for agreeing to participate. This is an opportunity for our citizens in Waxahachie to hear from candidates on the important topics facing our city. Each candidate will be allotted the same amount of time, as mentioned earlier, to provide their insight on multiple topics. So, with that said, candidates, the forum format is as follows. Candidates will make certain that they are here and ready to draw for order, which they've already done. And we are going to have one minute for brief self-introductions, followed by three additional minutes to speak on the following. So we will go through to, and I have everyone go ahead and introduce themselves for one minute and then come back to question. All right, we will start off that way as well. Everybody has their independent minute, but first we'll start with Mr. Christensen. Paul oh, Christensen, tell us a little bit about yourself. Why, thank you. It's just an honor to be able to speak with you today, and thank you everyone who took the time to come down here. I can't tell you what an honor it is it is for me to serve the city of Waxahachie. Many of you already know me, and I, I'd like to say that I can't really do an introduction in one minute, but I'm going to do the best I can. Many of you already know me. You've seen me at the city council meetings. You've heard me speak. You've read my pages and, and postings on next door, where I have overwhelming support from the people here in Waxahachie. I've met 2,000 people, over 2,000 people, people in this city as I've walked around. Many of you have told me what you believe. It's been so interesting. And I can't tell you how much I enjoy meeting everyone. This really is an honor and a fun for me. I would like to start out by saying, so that you can know a little bit about me, is I'm a devout conservative Republican. I believe in the free market. I am a devout supporter of our conservative values and our Constitution, and I will defend those if I am elected to city council. Excellent. All, All right. right. I, then it goes really quickly. I'm yeah, <laughs> that, it's so close. But don't worry, you'll get a three minute follow up just a minute there. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go to our next candidate. Uh, please introduce yourself. I'm Mary Lou Shipley. And my name is Mary Lou Shipley. 
It has been my privilege to serve on your city council since I was first elected in 2014. And I would like to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, for those of you who do not know. I've lived in Waxahachie for over 40 years. After serving on the Waxahachie Planning and Zoning Commission for several years, uh, in 2014, I was asked by a group of citizens to run for the city council. And I thought about it for quite a long time, but I agreed to run. I've been interested in local government for many years, having served as both an assistant and as the elected district attorney of Ellis County in the 90s, and also as an assistant city attorney for the city of Dallas. My experience in those positions, my private law practice, my tenure on the Waxahachie Planning and Zoning Commission, and my six years on the city council have given me a clear understanding of the various functions of city government. And that understanding and knowledge is essential in this time of really rapid growth in our city. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Shelley. Next candidate is Billy Wallace. Hello. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here uh, to allow you to get to know me better. I was born and raised here, native. Shortly after graduating Waxahachie High School, I joined the police force, Waxahachie Police Department, where I spent 30 years patrolling the streets and protecting the citizens. I know this city, I love this city. This city has been me my entire life. I retired from the police department in 2016. That same day I retired, I took a job with the National Insurance Crime Bureau as a white collar investigator, which is my current position now. Throughout my adult life, I served on various boards. I'm currently the Rotary of Waxahachie president. I'm married to Judge Doug Wallace, and I have one daughter, Andy Wallace. It's a commercial pilot. Thank you. All right, thanks, Wallace. Let's do a new round of applause for all of our candidates to place here. <laughs> and now we're going to move on to place five. Please introduce yourself, Mr. Chuck Bailey. Oh, just kidding. We jumped over. I thought that there. I thought that was Ross. Oh, you're good. You're good. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, I'm from Ennis, Texas. I graduated from Ennis in 2001 and went off to college at the University of Texas at Arlington. And I started my career as a child protective services investigator. And um, I've always been in a mentoring and social work field. Uh, I was a Texas Juvenile Justice Department senior case manager. And uh, everything I've always done has been to, uh, to help broken families, to help underprivileged communities, and to serve at risk youth. And so um, as this city grows, uh, which is growing very rapidly, we're going to have to have prevention measures in place to take care of all that. And so uh, that's why I'm here. We need those programs in place while the city do what it does. So I'm here to make sure we have those. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Now we'll go on to Mr. Chuck Bailey. Okay, thank you very much, yes, sir. Thanks for having us along tonight. Thanks for everybody for coming out. My name is Charles Chuck Hatchet <laughs> Bailey. Uh, only my late grandmother used to call me Charles. Most people call me Chuck, and most of the people in, in, uh, grew up with, went to college with, they called me the Hatchet Man or uh, Hatchet. So uh, I was first selected. I grew up in Walks Hatchet, right after the Turner High School. And uh, you know, graduated from the University of North Texas. I played professional football with Pittsburgh Steelers, St. Louis Cardinals, Florida Blazers, WFL, and also I was a Boy Scout executive for some 30 years in Dallas and St. Louis and back to back to Dallas. So uh, my whole life been working with youth and giving something back to the community. And uh, you know, uh, I was first elected to the city council in 1995, and I uh, was elected mayor in 97, served to 2002. So this is some um, 20 some years later. I had hair back then, but it's gone. But uh, you know, I'm happy to be here 
still got the energy to serve the people, so that's why I'm running for re-election. All right, and uh, uh, the final candidate on the forum up here, I recommend for this time, is Mr. Travis Smith. My name is Travis Smith, and I don't believe the Chuck Lady ever had here. Uh, <laughs> as long as I have been born and raised here in Hawks uh, I, I have known and grown to love this community and the heritage that we do have here. We have such a unique opportunity to, to continue to to, to grow that through our small business sector. And that's why I have recently moved from the newspaper realm as a journalist, which I was the editor year for four for plus years, uh, into a small business consultant role. And it's a no cost role because I feel that giving back to the community that gave so much to me and invested in me is the most important thing that I can do. Um, this is home, and home isn't just where the heart is, home, home is home. And to keep it that way needs to be something that, that we don't just plan for for three to five years down the road, but something that I look forward and I hope to earn your trust to continue to do as long as the Honorable Chuck Fade has, has that done. And again, my name is Travis Smith, and I'm ready for place five. All right, let's give a round of applause for our place. Our right. candidates, uh, welcome. Thank you for those great introductions. Uh, you've got one minute for those, but you can have a total of three additional minutes to speak on the following topics. So if you'd like to make any notes about it, uh, please do so. I'll read it again after we uh, complete up with the uh, place four candidates. I'll read it again for place five candidates. But you have three minutes. I'll be timing you, and I'll go ahead and give you a one minute warning there so you can close it down. Um, it sounds like we've got some pretty, uh, pretty experienced speakers here, so you guys are pretty good with time. So that being said, here is the topic for our discussion tonight for your three minutes. Waxahachie is experiencing consistent growth that affects our business and citizens in many ways. Topics like economic development, tax incentives, attracting new businesses to the city, city budget, tax rate, and ongoing vision for the city are consistent topics of interest. What do you find are the most important of these topics and how will you affect change in that area if elected to the city council. We will begin with Mr. Christmas. Thank you. We all know what's going on with the city of Waxahachie. I know you do, I've spoken with you about it. Six years ago, our, city, our conservative city manager was replaced. Since then, we've seen astronomical increases in property taxes, hurting so many people. The people that have become to be known as the forgotten men and women and families of Waxahachie. The high taxes are hurting people's budgets, driving people out of their homes, and hurting our businesses. While at the same time, we see no improvement in city services. What's gone wrong? And our city has taken on massive new levels of debt. My vision for the city of Waxahachie and our city council and our city government allows the citizen to guide our spending decisions. We should develop a strategic plan and focus our resources where people want us to. The input of our families, businesses, and work via liquor has so long been neglected. My vision for the future includes a budget and a strategic spending plan that stops overburdening taxpayers and that appropriately addresses ongoing maintenance and infrastructure costs. Right now, our city has been taking on new debt and alarming rate and unjustifiably increasing ta property taxes. And now our people are overburdened and hurting badly. At the same time, our city has amassed a cash hoard of something like $30 million. They took our money and they didn't even need to do it. The city's policy over the last few years has been increased taxes, takes people's money from them without any specific objectives or explanations provided. We can do a lot better than this. My vision for the future is to stop this ever-increasing tax burden. In the long term now, the way it looks, that we would continue to experience heavier and heavier traffic congestion weather due to a lack of planning. Our city has, well, they say they have a comprehensive plan, but if you've ever seen it, you know it doesn't exist. 
and they issue variance after variance after variance. My vision for the future is a zone and development plan that would just and build out secondary roads like other cities have done, but which we, we have failed to do, and now we are choking on traffic. We should establish a zoning and growth plan agreed to by the, the people to attract new businesses and properly manage the growth. And our new communities should also include green spaces with trees. They don't now. And natural gas and cable hookups. That's what we deserve as a city. My vision also includes CC discounts on impact fees for building out water and wastewater lines that we provide to developers and that we fund. These impact fees are designed to attract new development, but what's the hatch is designed without this, these discounts paid for by us. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Christopher. We'll move on to Ms. Mary Lou Shipley. Shipley, your response. Thank you. Uh, in my six years on the city council, it has been my privilege to work with fellow council members, the city manager, and the staff every year to present a balanced budget. And I am especially proud that last year, during the time of the pandemic, we were able to lower our tax rate. Now, I know there is confusion, uh, and it, this term is misused frequently. Our tax rate has been lowered. Your taxes may have gone up though, and that's because your property is, is worth lower. And we really don't have much control over that. But leaving that, last year we were able to lower our tax rate. In spite of the pandemic, we were able to maintain services and we were able to avoid laying off or furloughing employees. We've been fortunate in the past six years to be able to improve our parks, our hike and bike trails, create a new amphitheater. We've worked to make Waxahachie an ideal location for new business. And as our residents all know, Waxahachie is growing. We're fortunate that our growth is well balanced between residential, commercial, manufacturing, and retail. And this is not just an accident. It's the result of careful planning and management. The City Council and the City staff are committed to emphasizing new business and residential development that matches up with our desire to have a high quality of life here. We have put great effort into rebuilding our aging infrastructure. You know, Waxahachie is an old city, and we're really proud of that because we have so many wonderful historic um, properties that, that attract people. Um, and we have, we have put a lot of effort into preserving our historic downtown area. We have worked to create green spaces, dedicated land for schools, and positively supported our police and firefighters. Financially, Waxahachie is in a strong condition. Through sound economic management, we were able to lower our tax rate and reduce utility billing this past year to try to help meet the city needs of citizens during the pandemic. I take great pride in the accomplishments that we've made during this time in office, and I look forward to more during the time is to come. A couple of things, or, or maybe just one thing I really want to point out is the, ta the comments about the tax incentives. Tax incentives draw new business to Waxahachie. Never during my time in office have we offered or granted, we don't offer incentives, but we do grant them sometimes. We have never done one that resulted in a loss to us. They always provide increases for us. All right. Thank you, Ms. Moving on to Billy Wallace, your response. I want to start with economic development. Our city is growing like most cities are. Managed growth. We need managed growth here in Waxahachie. We've outstripped our infrastructure with the present growth. And any future growth must have an integrated infrastructure plan that does not shift the cost of growth 
to the citizen and it benefited the growth to the developer. Tax incentives. I want to speak a little bit on tax in incentives. Tax incentives for businesses that provide employment opportunities for those who live in Waxahachie and those relocating here. A full employment goal where everyone who wants to work can find a job that pays a decent living wage. And it should be the most important factor when offering tax incentives to businesses relocating here to Waxahachie. Attracting new businesses. We have commercial space available here. The airport, industrial sites, they can be utilized to house and build new businesses. City budget. I want to give taxpayers the biggest bang for their buck while providing the essential services without compromise. I want to fight to lower taxes, the tax burden on our citizens. Part of that process is to put the city's checkbook online. Waxahachie citizens should be able to see where and how their money is being spent. Ongoing vision for the city. This needs to be developed with the input of our citizens and city leaders. We should not be a default to the will of a developer. We must control the growth and we must know we're attempting to go and what we're attempting to become. Waxahachie is 171 years old. The beauty and the warmth of our city is due to the hard work of its citizens. They should be at the heart of our vision. The plan for this city cannot continue to be a secret or available only online or limited ways to those who wish to turn over the stone and go to the proverbial Easter egg hunt to find it. It should be on billboards, newspapers, online, and posted publicly. We have to reach every citizen, not just the citizen that's online. Oh, uh, we reach the top. Thank you so much, Ms. Walsh. Just in case you're joining us in here on the radio, on uh, Mile 1390 AM 99.1 FM, Austin, Texas, music KBC. We're in the middle of our 2021 City Council Candidate Forum. Our co hosts and platforms are Sandy King with Waxahachie Chamber of Commerce, uh, as well as Scott Brooks with Waxahachie Summit, and Jim Phillips with KBC Radio. And we've gone through three of our uh, place candidates here, Mr. Christensen, Ms. Shipley, and Ms. Wallace. Now we're going to move again to place five. I'm going to just catch up our listeners on the topic that we are discussing right now. The question posed to the uh, candidates is, Waxahachie is experiencing consistent growth that affects our businesses and citizens in many ways. Topics like economic development, tax incentives, attracting new businesses, city budget, tax rate, and ongoing vision for the city are consistent topics. Why do you, what do you find, excuse me, are the most important of these topics, and how will you as a candidate affect change in the areas that you are elected? We'll move to place five and start with Mr. Darren Robinson. Darren, your responses. All right, um, people are pissed off. I'm here to represent the people and restore power to the people. Uh, I'm 38 years old. I came here in 2017 uh, because Waxahachie was small, it was rural, uh, but it was growing, and I, and I accepted that. Uh, me and my family did. I'm from Ennis, so I've, I've seen the transition that Waxahachie has gone through, and uh, we moved here from Cedar Hill, staying in Austin, staying in Irving, and all that stuff and uh, came here for a reason. Came here and found out that the people, the people are pissed off. They don't know what's going on with the taxes. They don't know what's going on in the city. They don't know any of the plans. There's no vision that people can, I've asked people, well, what is the vision for the city? They have no clue. The people have no clue. And I, and I talk to people that, you know, in a leadership position, they say, well, you should came to the city council meeting, the people should have gotten a lot of this, that, that, but we blown up a red carpet for these businesses and give all these incentives, but when it comes to the citizens, you should have done this. 
You should have went on this little bumpy website. You should have clicked on this, clicked on that, clicked on this, clicked on that, and found out what we was talking about. You should have got the letter. There was a, a 200 uh, feet rule. We sent out a letter. You should have got word of mouth. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. The people are mad and pissed off because they don't know what's going on. People are leaving their city. People are moving out of their homes. People are becoming alcoholics. People are becoming, uh, getting divorced. All kinds of stuff because of the stuff that's going on in this city. We have to stop doing that to our own citizens. If we're going to roll out the red carpet to these businesses, we're going to roll out the red carpet to citizens. We live here. It shouldn't be just the people at the top or in these leadership positions that get all the information and make all these uh, changes and things and just say, oh, well, y'all should have, you should have learned about it. You should have been more involved, which I do agree. We should be involved. But the city council don't even come to us. Y'all don't come to the people. We have no clue. Ask the people. They don't even know who you guys are. The people do not know who the city council people are. There's thousands of new people here. Thousands. And we have to go on a worst wall to find you guys. That's wrong. So what I started doing is I started going around with small businesses. I've talked about 10, talked about 10 to 12 of them, and we're putting in plans of ways that they can sustain themselves without having to focus on the government. And hopefully we can work with the chamber and, and different organizations that's here with small businesses. But I started talking to them. We, we're putting plans together where when stuff like this pandemic and stuff happen again, they won't have to depend on the government. They won't have to depend on our business. We want the city to stay out of, stay out of our business, stay out of the government, stay out of it. But we are going to help put together plans where they can sustain themselves. One of the other things I've done, I started a pilot program for camping. I've got uh, uh, four fathers together. We had 10 sons. We've been on a primitive camping trip with four wheelers and all that kind of stuff just to kind of ease some of these burdens because people are pissed off. And people are losing their families behind and stuff. And so uh, we're putting things in place now to make sure that we can um, uh, defend for some of that stuff. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Our next candidate, Mr. Baker, your thoughts. Okay, thank you. That's a tough act to follow up, but I do my best. I know when I left off that, the, uh, going to college, the population was 12,749. That was a sign that the exit was going 77. 77 was a two lane road during that time. So now you can see that 77 is a four lane road from 287 all the way out to 35. And all that growth you know, didn't just happen. You know, all of that happened, planning, some of the old uh, fathers, city fathers, you know, brought all that to fruition, you know. We, uh, taxes, we survived uh, the downturn back in 1908, 2008. <coughs> we had to furlough people. And now, you know, we got covered in the staff. Uh, the people want to come to work in Walsh Hatchet. They want to live here. They want to raise a family here. And I think we're doing a good job. But the chair, you know, we uh, managed to, in the midst of a pandemic, give a tax cut to this year. We lowered anybody around us in this part of the world. Uh, we also, uh, other than giving a tax cut, we were able to help small businesses back survive that pandemic. And uh, you know, the only reason we've been able to do that with our taxes, saying we had low, we lowered the taxes. And the reason we've been able to do that is not put a lot of pressure on homeowners because we got all the retail businesses that come to our town. And the only way we get those is that we got rooftops. Without rooftops, you don't get retail, you don't get commercial. And all the tax burden is going to be on the citizens. I think we're very well around the city. As evidenced by the uh, art that we got recently, that you know, A1, that's the kind of rating that we got. And the taxes are necessary evil, but with, with those taxes, we've been able to improve the quality of life. We got, you know, sugar uh, plants. Mm -hmm. and, and now, you know, it's like I say, hey, we have the crossroads of Texas now, 287 and 35, and we're going to continue to grow. We just have to manage it. Thank you, sir. And now, finally, uh, Trent Smith, your thoughts on the topics. Yeah, so, like uh, Chuck just said, I think that was in uh, mid 1960s, we said that sign going out of town was about 13,000, right? 
Well, in, in uh, the mid to late 2000s, when I go to school every day on 813, that, that same sign, not the same exact sign, but any sign already 18,650. Uh, and that was the population then. In 2015, we roughly reached 33,000. Uh, at, at, and at that same time, we were projected to reach 40,000 by 2020, which we have done. And by 2035, we're projected to be around 73,000. By 2045, it's 180,000. And that's what it city. And that's why I'm running, is to, is to continue the legacy and, and the good responsible growth that this council has, has set forth and has done up until now. We've got to plan to the end. It's, it is not a three to five to six year deal here, guys. We are, we are experiencing tremendous growth, and we all see that. Our roadways and the main arteries are clogged. We, I mean, driving down 77 is a nightmare. But we have 192 ish square miles in our ETJ to help alleviate some of that. At the same time, we also have that. That, that same area that needs to be developed and will be developed. One thing that I heard last night at a meeting that, that sounds to be very important with folks there and on, you know, your walk that you talk and bus pages and things are, are the number of apartment complexes that, that we do have here now. And to be honest, it's not an overwhelming amount, but we need to make sure that we stay with the master plan and keep that percentage under, under 15 to 12 percent of the population inside the inside those apartments. Wow. Um, we do need to focus our our home growth and our home development on the single family one homes that are affordable to those that are that are in that, that 35 to 45 range of the educated individuals that have the disposable income that that will ultimately help Wasatchee continue on the path that it's on now and keep its heritage but also reinvest in small businesses and that's what it all comes back to. Wasatchee is not an academy. It's not a Buffalo Wild Wings. It's a Jimmy's. It's an Oma's. It's the Dove's Nest or a Multitude's or whatever it is. That is what that is, that is the heritage and the culture of Wasatchee. And that's the ultimate thing that we have to preserve at all times and keep our mind on that at, at, at all times. We've heard comments about the operating costs. And I mean, I, I, will, I will not sit here and promise to lower the tax rate at all, because if you lower that, then you have to cut something. And I don't think I'm cutting any kind of essential service anytime soon. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Swift. Let's give all of our candidates a round of applause here. First of all, if you're just joining us here on our live on the radio here on KPDC 1390 or 99.1 FM, uh, we are in the middle of our 2021 City Council Candidate Forum. We've got our six candidates up here Paul Christensen, Mary Lou Shipley, Lou Wallace, Chuck Betty, Gary Robinson, and Travis Smith. We're going to move to our second portion. Uh, of the uh, of the night, and we're going to talk about some Q and A, as opposed to a live Q and A with uh, folks asking questions due to COVID protocols. I'm passing microphones tonight, but we have had our audience ask some questions. You submitted them here to the uh, uh, to our bowl, and so I'm going to pull some of these out at random, ask some questions. Our format here is that I will draw a question for from the audience to be asked to each candidate, and uh, the Q and A session will last for six minutes per candidate. So I believe that each candidate will be allowed. Two minutes, two minutes each, there we go. <laughs> two minutes each. I know they'll probably love six minutes of person to go to that. But you get two minutes each to answer the question that is drawn. So we're going to start with Mr. Christensen. It's lucky to be number one here tonight. So we'll draw out question number one. You will have two minutes to respond to the question, Mr. Christensen. There we go. There you go. All right, our first question of the evening comes from Mr. Doug Wallace. How have you supported first responders? First responders are so important to us in this day and age with what's going on in this city. Not only first responders, but our police force. We love our police force. You know how important this is to us right now in these trying times? We need everything that we can do for public safety. I will commit to that and to our first responders. Can you 
you have a question? No, we're going to let all of them answer that same Everybody question. Everybody open that. Okay, yeah. All right. So, first responders, what have you done to support first responders for you, Mr. Cooper? I have certainly supported uh, every, getting everything they need as far as our budget goes. In our, in our uh, most, most recent budget, or actually it's in, I believe it'll be in our next budget, we are completely replacing our that the fire department uses in, in their various services, and we're, that's quite a big purchase, but we're pleased to be able to do it. And as far as my own support, I have regularly uh, visited with police officers. I always, at least if I know about it, I always go to their promotion ceremonies because I believe they deserve that kind of support from, from the city council. I want our first responders, not just the police, but the fire department too. I want them to know that we are behind them and that we are supporting them. One of the ways that I, I do that is by attending every, every ceremony they have that I know about. And as I, I think I mentioned the budget, but, but we see to it that they are staffed adequately, that we have a regular plan for um, replacing equipment, that we have a regular plan for increasing their numbers as needed. And um, I believe they would tell you that, that the city is looking after their needs. Ms. Wallace. First responders, uh, first responders uh, to me include police, fire, EMS, and the frontline medical. Uh, first responders to me uh, are very important. Seeing uh, that I spent 30 years uh, on the police department working alongside every one of these, I know just how important they are and what this city would be without them. That, that was the time, sorry, go ahead. I'll continue to su support them. I support them every day. I'm still uh, very close with many of them. Uh, on a, uh, if I'm elected, I want to ensure that they have everything they need to do the best job possible for our citizens. All right, Mr. Robinson. First responders, I love them. Uh, I was a CPS investigator in Dallas County. Uh, went to the home, took a lot of kids that were all beat to death. Uh, kids that were abused, neglected severely. Um, so I had to work with a lot of police officers. And without them, I wouldn't have been able to do the job I was doing. Um, and, and, and in another case, I'm from the hood. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, uh, all my brothers ended up going to juvenile jail and prison. And uh, I've never been incarcerated before, but that was because I was in power. Police at Liberty, I was in DARE. I was in all of these programs where police officers would tell me, don't go here, go in the house at night at this time, don't deal with these people, and I listen. So uh, I've always served them. So I do a lot of mentoring and speaking at schools and things now. And so I work with the resource officers to go back into the communities where there's a lot of gang infestation and infestation and talk to a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the people over there. And uh, I work with the gang unit, I work with um, school resources officers. So, uh, I love first response to anything they need, they can get it. Oh, Mr. Bain. Okay, what can I say? First responders, uh, new police administration there. Uh, we got a new police, uh, fire station. Uh, we already had nine f new firefighters to uh, go into a new fire station that we're building. And uh, this year we got another three we trying to get another grant. For those three, make a total of 12. So we'll have a full staff for the new fire station <coughs> that we build on the north side of town. And also, when it comes to you know, firefighters, uh, we also uh, like to be safe in our homes. Uh, the response time determines what your insurance rate will be on your home. So I think we have a two now, in both cities, large cities, like a plane or something, I get a one. So we look at a two and let it tell you what, what uh, insurance people think about how fire protection and response time. 
So those are the kind of things that we're doing to make sure people are safe in their homes and uh, you know have the right police protection so we feel safe in our homes and also be able to uh, uh, you know have that response time low your rates so that you know your insurance being so cool with that half so that you got on no not that high. So uh, that's what we're doing with our police department and uh firefighting first responders. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. So, first and foremost, I mean, to say, like, to answer the question, what have I done for first responders now, other than applaud their efforts, I haven't done a whole lot. I mean, we have written some articles about them in the past, and, and I hope those help, but I, I, can't adequately, I can't adequately answer the question. But what I do hope to do for first responders is I do hope that first and foremost is listen to them and understand their needs and what they do need inside their apartment because they're going to know better than any of us. Um, as far as the fire department and the ISO rating, we are currently at an ISO 2. To get to the ISO 1, which would give the tax breaks to the new businesses or those that are already here, will be incredibly tough to accomplish as our city continues to grow at the rate that it is growing. One way that you do that is you continue those four main staffs on, on uh, the fire trucks and those type of things because that ensures that you have two men inside the home and two men out. That also promotes the safety with, 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 within the fire department. I do applaud the city council for the efforts that have been done to ensure that, that we do have the four men staffing now so that we're, we're not having to train those folks when the fourth station is completed. And that's a huge step. Um, because the first thing that we need to, to focus on is their safety. Uh, living on the east side now, I, I've seen multiple times when police officers have not just patrolled the streets, that, that's not what they're doing, but, but they stop and they, they play basketball in front of my house five or six times. And at one time I thought something bad was going down because there were three or four cars out front, but it was actually just a friendly game of basketball. That's their own Printed lane. Um, so what we need to focus on is what their focus is on, and we just have to listen. That's I mean, that's that's all there is to it. That's all right. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to question number two here, number three. Just so you know, I'm being fair and equitable. I'm stirring the pot. All right. Our second question comes to us from Doug Wallace. What, oh, what can you do to include citizens into the development of your vision for the city? What can you do to include citizens into the development vision that you have for the city? Mr. Christensen. Well, I think a, a great approach would be to, uh, let's get a change of attitude in here. Anybody who's been to a city council meeting knows the common sending nature of the attitude in there. Do you ask questions? We need to change that. We need new leadership in city council. We need constant feedback. I envision a time when our citizens have citizen forums with us. They direct us. I've been involved in helping city governments, county governments, state governments, and businesses to improve their performance. The only way we can be successful at that is to get our customers involved. Our customers direct us so that we can make goods and services around what our customers do. We don't do that in our city council. We have a bunch of committees. Most of them don't really mean much and they're run by the same people year after year. We need to have bring our citizens into the process. The, the most well-functioning cities do this through a couple ways. They ask people, that's one thing they do, they go and ask them. They have forums with people. They have constant surveys and for satisfaction feedback from people. Just, we don't do anything like that. And we also should have routine reporting, and I can tell you what I envision is doing a, 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 an improvement helping us to design better services like I've done for so many businesses. 
around this country and so many governments around this country. And if I do that, I'm going to keep you informed step by step of the way on Facebook. You can count on that because I know I can't do this myself. You need to tell me how to do it and what you want done, and I will get it done for you. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Thank you. Uh, as far as getting more citizens involved, I would love to see more citizens involved. Every time the time the, the time of the year arises when we appoint new people to various city committees, uh, most of which are very active, um, we are lucky if we. We are lucky if we have enough people apply for those positions to fill all of them. Many times they don't. We would love to have more people get involved with various city activities. Uh, I ask people every time I talk to them, please sign up to be on some city committee. We need, we need your involvement. And everybody's busy. We understand that. I understand it. But the only way we can do what the citizens want is if, is if we hear from you. Uh, I know occasionally I get emails from various citizens, which I always respond to. Once in a while I get a phone call. And we talk to people at various meetings. But, and there is actually um, in the process right now a survey that the city is doing on on city services, and we'll have the results of that pretty quickly. But um, the best thing that the citizens can do to be involved is to, to be there, to participate. I know some of you listen online, some of you come to meetings, uh, but your input is welcome, and it makes a difference. Believe me, it makes a difference. So I, I would just encourage people to participate and do whatever you can. Write letters, send emails, uh, send text messages. We'll, we'll listen to you. All right, thank you, Ms. Shipley. Ms. Voss. I would say do what we're doing and do more. Institute of Citizen Panel of Willing Citizens that serve for a limited period of time, maybe, maybe a couple of years. Find ways to welcome our citizens. A warm welcome. When they go to the city council meeting, be friendly. Act like you're excited that they're involved, that they showed up. Every city council meeting I've ever been to, it's Everybody has this stoic look on their face, like they really don't want to be there. Makes you not want to be there either. Have more ways to reach the public, not just online. It's our job to create new ways to reach every citizen of our fine city. All right, thank you so much. Mr. Robertson, your thoughts? Uh, this is a volunteer job interview, and I'm asking the people to hire me to represent their voice. They're telling me what they want to live in, what city they want to live in, what they want the taxes to be like, what they want the schools to be like, this, that, and the other. And I'm saying that I'll get on the city council to represent that. My job is to present a plan to the city council, let's work it out, whatever we gotta do to get that plan in place, and then present it to the citizens say, yeah, your name, majority wins. You know, if the majority of you know, the people want a certain type of city to live in with a certain type of vision, that's who needs to get that. But we have to go back and ask the citizens, our bosses, what is it that you guys want us to tweet, what do you want to live in, and put it to a vote, whatever we need to do. But our bosses, the majority of them, needs to win. And I don't think we have a lot of that. You know, I'm here to work for the people. I'm here to work for uh, the people that put me in this seat. And if I don't do my job, two years, get me out of here. Vote me out. You know, if I don't do what the citizens that put me in this seat tell me to do, get me out of there. That's the way it works. We don't have citizen involvement. 
we do, the right now the city council kind of do what they want to do, which is why people are pissed off. Which is why people don't come to the meetings, people don't trust the city council, because the city council kind of do what they want to do. And I know that there's opportunities, I know that we're supposed to get online and check this, that, and the other, but again, like, like Billy was saying, it, it's not an inviting type of place. And you guys may feel a little offended by that, but I'm telling you what the people are saying. You know, you guys are not present in the community. You guys make it hard for us to find out what is going on. You know, a lot of people, especially the elderly, they don't want to get on that. The, the website is bulky as all get out. Nobody knows how to do all that stuff. But that's what I'm here for. That's what, I'm, that's what they're, they're putting me here for. That's what I'm asking to be hired for, to get up here and do what the people say do. And if I don't do my job, get me out of here. And that's for everybody. If people don't do what we say, what they say they're going to do, when you vote them in the seat, get them out the seat. Put somebody in the seat that will. Majority wins. All right. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Payne, your thoughts? I understand that people are busy. They have a lot of things they involved in with the kids, the jobs, and uh, the midst of this pandemic. People are helping to come out. So what I need to do, uh, last Tuesday of every month, I meet with a group of citizens, you know, and they can bring their concerns to me. So I take the show on the road, and I'll just wait for them to come out and see me at City Council. Peace. I have a lot to do in Paris in the town, and some do come. But like I said, I take the show on the road, and I just wait on people to come to where I am to see me. Even though we do have those uh, 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 media things that, you know, they can go on our website, they can do different things, but, you know, I'll take the show on the road. That's what I do. We'll see people. All right, Mr. Smith. Yeah, I feel like this entire question has been made way too, way too complicated. Uh, the easy answer is to go see the people themselves. Uh, transparency and trust are the most important things for any council or board or governing body. And that transparency isn't, isn't just earned through posting things on a website or on Facebook or next door or whatever that is. Transparency is being present and being available. It's attending chamber functions. It is, it is attending, it, it is attending high school baseball games. It is showing up where you know that folks will see you and can ask you the tough questions in a comfortable setting for them. They don't need to come to you at all. That's, that's, that's not what our job is on the city council. Our job is to be your voice and to be your, your voice. We need to be where you are comfortable enough to speak about the things that are on your heart to speak about. And those passion projects that you want to see done to, to a, a point that I heard just a few minutes ago on the lack of interest in joining boards. I, I beg to differ. I feel like there have been quite a few times, especially the past three years, when we've had over we have had over the number of applicants apply for boards and commissions within the city, but we but we continue to, to choose and appoint that same small group. That that trend is why I joined with the chamber to start the young professionals group to engage our under 40 crowd to help bridge that gap between the 25 and the between the 25 and the 40, with that 65 plus, it seems to make every single decision within our city. And I'm not saying that they're making wrong decisions because they're not. They've got us to the great place that we're in now. But we're in a position to pivot and to truly bridge that gap. And to do that, we have to restore transparency, trust, and a renewed energy on city council. All right. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Let's give our candidates a round of applause. We give our final question now. So hard to blind you on these. Pull them straight. Okay, there we go. All right. Testing. All right, so we're going to go back to our first uh, place in the year, our, our first candidate, Mr. Christian. Do you believe the owner of property has a right to develop his, his or her property under current city zone? This includes multifamily zone. Yes or no? Uh, well, they do and they don't. I mean, there is a state law that says that if you want to uh, subdivide your property, you have the right to do that. That's the state law. You know, these impact fees are bothersome. We, we shouldn't have to 
We give these developers discounts to build out wastewater and water lines. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't be paying for that. This is a desirable place to come to. I also, and because it costs us money, that we need proper zoning plans. We don't have those right now. We need to come up with a zoning plan and stick with that zoning plan. This whole concept that we're going to grow and grow faster, and it's inevitable, is costing us a bunch of money. And taxpayers, we're already overburdened. When can we just say, let's stop, let's take a look around, let's plan this. Why are we choking our highways up? Why are we building a hodgepodge of the same types of houses everywhere in massive development, clogging up our streets? So, yeah, they, they do have the right to do that, but we also have a right to manage that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kristen. Sure. Let me just clarify something. When a developer comes to town and wants to put in a subdivision, they have to put in the vast majority of the utilities that will serve that subdivision. That is not put on the taxpayers of this city. Um, as far as we have zoning ordinances, we expect people to comply. plan that has been put in place for a number of years. It is updated and revised periodically. Uh, that will continue to happen to suit the needs of the, um, uh, of, of the people that are coming here. Uh, we don't always know who's going to be coming here and what they're going to, what kind of residences they want. We have a mix of those. We have uh, small homes, we have mid-sized homes, we have large homes. We have apartment complexes, we have town homes. We have a new concept that is going in over off uh, um, 1446, which is uh, called cottage homes. We have a lot of different options for people. Um, Everybody doesn't fit in the same kind of place, and so we try to provide those. And it is reasonable that people should have to comply with zoning ordinances, unless they have some good reason to have an exception made, and that happens from time to time. But I, I think our zoning ordinances and our, our regulations as far as building goes uh, are serving our city well. Right. Ms. Wallace, your thoughts on the uh ability of the owner to develop their property under the current city zone. I feel that citizens should uh, to a degree, uh, but the big thing here is that before somebody decides to come here to develop here, that they know the uh, regulations and the, um, the uh, zoning and that they're they're um, willing to follow those before they ever even decide to, to come here or to develop here. I think that would help. Um, just recently I've heard citizens, you know, that, that are gonna have things built around them. They had no idea when they built their home. Uh, they came here to live, live out the rest of their life and now um, they wanna put their house up on the market because they, they weren't sure uh, or weren't aware and maybe even uh, lied to by their builder. Uh, that's what they, they said. So it's so important that they know beforehand, uh, along with, uh, you know, follow those ordinances and rules that are in place to keep our city wonderful. All right, before we get to our next candidate, we have to stop just a second. You're in the middle of listening to uh, our 2021 City Council Candidate Forum. Uh, sponsored by our
Waxahachie Chamber of Commerce with Sandy King and the Waxahachie Sun Scott Brooks, as well as uh, your home of classic Texas music, KBBC, 1390 AM and 99.1 FM here in Waxahachie. Uh, we're going to move on to our other candidate, Mr. Darren Robinson. We're asking the question, do you believe that the owner of the property has the right to develop his or her property under current city zoning? This includes multi-family zoning. Uh, Mr. Robinson, your thoughts? Uh, I say yes, and uh, I'm not familiar with all that stuff. Uh, I'm going to ask the people what they want. And, uh, but my initial reaction, I want the government as far as, as possible. Uh, as can be out of the lives of uh, people. So, I know it's not all the way 100% uh, possible, but as less government as we can have in people's lives, I want that. So, yes. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Okay, a lot of times, you know, that property's already been zoned previously, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, and we really don't have much to say about that. It goes through planning and zoning. A lot of people don't know that. We found out about what plan is going to tell us what they, what they want. And a lot of times, you know, it takes three, four folks for the city council to overturn plan is going and what they wish to do. But no, a person don't have the right to come in and just put up a, a structure, any kind of structure anywhere, in any part of town. It just won't fit. And as far as the developer is concerned, you know, we have what we call uh, impact fees. They have to pay to put in a lot of those services that we, we end up putting in, like uh, water, sewer, we upgrade the lines and, and upsize them. But the developers pay for those kind of fees. So the city don't be paying for all that new development that comes in. It, it's all driven by impact fees. And also, like I said, previous development, planning and zoning, what they tell us to get and Mr. Smith. Dr. Morgan, can you repeat the question? I so can, absolutely. Do you believe that the owner of a property has the right to develop his or her property under current city zoning? And that would include multi-family zoning. So I hear that as should the city council be able to restrict the private property owner from developing their land that's already been zoned. And to that, the answer is, is no, we should not be able to restrict that by any means. But to that same point, like what Chuck just said, most of that land has been zoned 15, 20, 30 years out. There's a master plan for a reason. Uh, and that master plan will typically call for what the demographics are projected to grow into. So to, to even pretend that, that, that we should have the ability to restrict that development is just silly. And I don't, I don't know why I'm going to continue jump was to a developer. That's not the way that I heard the question. The way that I heard the question was a private property owner. Uh, and no, we should not be able to restrict that. Now, if now if it goes before PNZ to to replant that land and and to move from single family one, two, or three into a multi-family, well, then that, that's something that we should seriously consider after it goes through. P and Z, assuming that it does, uh, their recommendation does carry a whole lot of weight. At the end of the day, the council's job is is to ensure that economically it makes sense for the city. Uh, so to answer the question as briefly as I can, the answer is no. We should not be able to restrict the private landowner from developing their own land. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. All right, candidates, that concludes our second portion of the evening, the Q&A session. And uh, all our candidates, too, thank you, first of all, for having uh, the courage to come up and uh, speak to us in public and give us your opinions. We've covered a multitude of topics this morning, our city, excuse me, uh, from everything from zoning to uh, citizen involvement uh, to our local uh, first responders, too. So thank you for those responses. Our last section here is just a two-minute closure uh, for you as a candidate to give us some closing remarks. So every candidate will have two minutes to make their closing remarks and uh, speak here to the public. So again, uh, as you've done multiple times tonight, Mr. Christian, we'll start with you. Can I test any? Yes. The old hospital boondoggle that's going to cost us $1.1 million to tear, tear down. Uh, the new city hall annex, which is going to house one department. We can do, these are just two examples. We can do a lot better than that. I want you to know I'm passionate about this. You can see this in my tone. 
I have spent the last 30 years teaching companies and state and local governments how to provide better services and operate efficiently. That's what I've been doing with my life. What I have done so for so many businesses and governments before, I now want to do for you. We should conduct a full-scale operational efficiency study. You know, I heard from one of our candidates that if we lower taxes, we need to cut something. Well, I've been involved in over 40 projects just like this. You can lower taxes without cutting anything. If you improve your services, that often results in more efficiency and lower costs. That's, that's the way that it works. And that's what we can do for this city. This is what I've done over 40 times before, and I can do that for you now. There's many, many opportunities that abound, thousands of them. This is a people-oriented process where we bring our, city, our great city people into this and help us focus our services on what we want, what we can do better, with the goal of increasing and improving services and keeping our budget in place. I'm the only one that stands in the in front of you tonight. I have an MBA in operational management from the best, one of the best business schools in this country, and I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm the only one here that can do this for you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Christensen, let's give a round of applause. Thank you, Christensen. Ms. Shipley, your final comment. Thank you. A couple, of, a couple of points just to address first. It's been brought up about the old Baylor Hospital and also about the proposed uh, City Hall Annex that's going to be built. And I will address those very briefly. First, the old hospital uh, is going to be demolished because that will, first, it's not usable. Uh, there, it would cost a great deal of money to, uh, uh, to try to make it usable again. It is not usable. Uh, but the property that it's on, once it has been, the, the buildings have been removed, the property are ripe for development and there is a need for it in that part of town. There's a lot more I could say on that, but I'm not going to. Secondly, as far as the City Hall Annex that people are talking about, um, if you've been in our City Hall recently, you probably realize that it is jam-packed full of employees. Uh, there are people who work literally in broom closets. This is not an extravagance. It's something that is badly needed. It's been needed for a long time, and so we're going to do it. Now, in closing, first, I, I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce, uh, KDEC, and want to thank you, son, for providing this forum. And I thank you all for coming, and those online and listening on the radio, I thank them, too. We need an educated electorate, and, and you are being a part of that by being here and listen, listening. I'm also a bit puzzled about some of the comments from some of the candidates about transparency. Since just this week we received the annual report from our auditors giving us the highest rating possible for financial reporting and transparency. So I, I, someone has poor information. And maybe that points to the fact that where we are in our city government, in our city generally, uh, is that this is not a time for on-the-job learning by the city council. Uh, the qualities that I bring to this position are responsiveness. I do respond to the citizens. Competence. Yeah. I, Go ahead and finish your sentence. Okay. Uh, Competence, experience, and those three are essential for an effective city council person. I ask for your vote in the upcoming election so that I can continue to serve the great hometown that is Waxahachie. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Shipley. Good morning. Good morning. Candidate Penny Wallace, your final comments. I want to thank the sponsors for tonight's event. I want to thank all of you in the audience, and I want to thank all of you online for giving us the opportunity to tell you more about us and what we offer to this important office. I'm running for this office because I love Waxahachie. I've been serving the citizens of Waxahachie my entire adult life. I want to use my leadership and my experience to, to become a vital part of this office. 
Back in early 2020, at the onset of the pandemic, I saw a need and I responded. I formed a group, a nonprofit group, that has now over 2,000 members where approximately 76 families have been adopted, families in need. I want to bring that same level of leadership to this office. I want to work alongside other city officials, other council members, to make sure that we keep Waxahachie great. I know I can do great things in this office as I have every office leading up to this one. I would be honored to have your vote. Thank you so much for being here tonight and allowing us this time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Moss. Uh, Darren Robinson, your final thoughts. Waxahachie uh, is a great city. I love it here. Um, been back and forth to Waxahachie pretty much all of my life. Um, I love it. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to grow here. My family here. We're going to plant here. We're going to be here. One thing I do notice is that there is a huge diversity issue on the leadership and committees and stuff here at Waxahachie. And there's no way you can have an all white city council adequately represent everybody in this community. So my biggest focus is to make sure that there is diversity, make sure that everyone's included. I've been on the east side and they say, you know, nobody ever come and really talk to us. And uh, I've been at the GOP meetings and things like that. And people say, you know, a lot of people say that they don't go over there because a lot of people don't vote. Well, that don't mean that you don't go over there and listen to the concerns of the people on the east side. You still go and listen to what their concerns are. So uh, I, I definitely, definitely uh, want to bring that diversity here and keep it here. And for this generation, I mean, we younger, we, we do social media, we do it like that's how a lot of us communicate. Right? It's just a different time, a different age, and I'm here to represent that. I'm here to be that new voice and be that, uh, that, that one that can relate to this time and to, to this generation. Um, so I love it here, I'm going to grow here, and I'm going to be here a long time. Um, so thank you guys so much for hearing us out. Thank you guys so much for being here. And uh, I plan to be in the seat to represent everybody that's going to put me in that seat. Have a good one. Ladies and gentlemen, Darren Robinson. <laughs> Mr. Chuck Bader, your final thoughts. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming in. <laughs> I know you guys are doing other things and, you know, but I'm uh, glad you had it. First of all, I'd like to just uh, walk to the east. We uh, rebranded that sometime, but we're going to call it east side anymore. As you can see, uh, all the new homes and the parks and what we could call now uh, walk to a downtown sports company. So, you know, that's one thing. Another thing I like to talk about a little bit is our debt. And people say, yeah, you got so much debt. Why do you have debt? And the reason we have debt is that all the new growth, uh, we wrote a check for everything, and the new people would have an opportunity to participate in that, pay for all the goods and services that we deliver. So that's one of the reasons that we have uh, debt, you know, and also, as Mary Lou alluded to, our financial statement that came out this year in the audit. Another thing is, you know, the hospital. Do you know anybody out there needs a brick truck? You got plenty of brick uh, development to come in and open that will try that middle of the hospital and make it usable for that park we got along with uh, Chicago. That'd be a nice story to redevelop that west side down that way, you know. Another thing, you know, I'm, I'm running because, uh, you know, I'm native. You know, I like to lay down and go to the pastor, so to speak, you know, hang up my cleats.
I'm here to serve. And this is my own town. Thank you. Please help us check back. Kenneth Smith, your final comments. So I won't make it a habit to address cans when shots are taken, but I drop down Peter Street every day. Uh, I, I saw that somebody the other day had visited with Jimmy Singleton, and I played football with her husband, her uh, Queen. I mean, I saw that that was on there too, and, and, and those are the people that I'm the voice of. Walks out to East has not been neglected at all. Penny Park is fantastic. From the time that I was playing literally there to the time that it's at now, the growth there has been outstanding. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's something that I look forward to continuing. There is there's a project that was started that there's a creek that, that runs behind the pub that, that connects the creeks. And there is no reason for that creek project to not be completed. Because that would just complete your entire circle and connect your trailhead at the amphitheater that can then connect on a two mile stretch to the old hospital. And we can develop an actual cultural district there. And that's a project that I want to see through. There's no reason for that area to not be developed to walk past its own version of a cave trail. But in order to make that happen, we need energy on the council and Sorry, so we need some longevity on the council in order to make that happen and to see that through from start to finish. And that's not to take a shot at the current council. They have gotten us to this point, but now we've got to go across the finish line and we've got to see that through. All of that project will, will, will prove to do is to continue to infuse money and sales tax into our downtown merchants. Because again, the downtown merchants, the downtown district, that is the lifeblood of Los Angeles. That is the charm that people move here for. Between that and our great spaces, that is Los Angeles. And if we lose that, we lose what we are, and we become the next Mansfield or Midlothian. We cannot afford to lose that. We cannot afford to lose the momentum that we have gained thus far. And we have got to spend the next three to five to seven years ensuring that we plan for that. 103,000 projected that are going to be here by 2025. Huh? Ladies and gentlemen, Ken and Travis Smith. Before we close out, we're going to have a quick word from our co hosts and platforms. Please welcome to the stage Ms. Sandy King of the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce. Hey, because God bless you all for what you do. <laughs> so I just want to make sure everybody knows that uh, you, can, you can say what you want, you can do what you want, but unless you show up at the polls to vote, then what you say and what you do does not matter anymore. So if you can make it out to the polls, I'm going to give you all the information, but I'll also for those of you online, I'll go on and post it on our Chamber Facebook page as well. Early voting starts on April 19th, that's Monday, April 19th. The locations include the Elections Office, which is over on Jefferson Street downtown, as well as the Waxhatchee ISD Admin Building, which is on Gibson Street. Uh, they, there are varying times, so during the week it's open from 8 to 5, on the weekend, on Saturday it's going to be 8 to 4, um, and then the times will change that second week. Uh, so I will post all of that information. Election day is on May 1st. The election offices will open at 7 a.m. and not close until 7 p.m. So there's plenty of time outside of work to uh, vote on election day. And they've opened up five different locations, including the Ellis County Women's Building, Farley Street Baptist Church, Marvin Elementary, Park Meadows Baptist Church, and the Salvation Army of Ellis County, which is owned by the police department. So you guys, thank you again very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Morgan, for helping participate. The participants get their points across today. And to my co-host, Scott Brooks in the audience, and Mr. Jim Phillips with KDC and the Los Angeles Sun, uh, we appreciate this opportunity to get out of uh, all of this information to the citizens. So thank you all for being here tonight and for all of you guys tuning in. Have a good evening. For those of you who are listening to this live on KBBC 13 at 8 a.m. and 9.1 a.m., a couple other forums will be taking place in the next couple of
at least. Uh, first of all, the Bucks have to get a school district forum regarding the bond will take place from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, here in the FAC on April 13th. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, tomorrow night, excuse me, tomorrow night, from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. here in the Fire Center. The second WISD forum regarding the bond will take place on April 13th, Monday, April 13th, from 6 to 7 p.m. here in the Waxhatchee ISD Fire Arts Center. Additionally, the United States Congressional District 6 Republican Candidate Forum, sponsored by the Concerned Republican Citizens, will take place Monday night, April 12th, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Crate Myrtle Room in the Civic Center in Waxhatchee. And KBEC will be broadcasting that live. It is open to the public. Again, thanks all of you for being here live and first with us. And for those of you listening on the radio on KBEC 1390 and 99.1 FM walks ahead. She was touching it wrong somewhere. Oh.